Hello and welcome to our time of worship. My name is Bill Grace, the minister here at St. Luke's Presbyterian Church, Oshawa. Uh, We welcome you here for our virtual time of worship. Uh, I'm recording this on Friday evening. Uh, The news has already gone out that we are um, in Ontario going into tougher lockdown restrictions. Uh, Just a reminder for all of us to take extra care, to look out for one another, Um, Stay in touch uh, by phone, email, video call, whatever you do, um, to make sure that we we stay together as a a family and look out for one another. Uh, This coming Tuesday is the third Tuesday of the month. We would usually have our collection time in the parking lot where people would drop off their offering for the month of April. We are putting that on hold until further notice. Uh, If you are able to give online through e-transfer on banking, that is still an option. But um, until we hear otherwise, we're, we won't be collecting uh, offering for April yet. Um, besides that, the announcements, we are also holding off on any idea of our next outdoor service. It was set to be uh, the second Sunday of May, for which was Mother's Day weekend, but just we'll have to wait and and until closer to the date to see if that will be something that we'll be doing. Also, speaking of staying in touch with one another, we are having our Zoom chat following the service. It should be in the YouTube link, goes out in the email, um, a way just to say hello to one another as we uh, still find a way to be distanced, but also together at the same time. Let us now enter into our time of worship as we Go to our call to worship. We gather with joy, for Easter brings us new life. The risen Christ is with us wherever we go. Love breaks all bonds and unites us in hope. Christ has defeated death. Let us rejoice and be glad. Come and worship with hearts full of praise. O God, receive our grateful hallelujahs. Amen. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart, not be all else to me save that thou art. Still be my vision. 
Satan, O ruler of all. Let us pray. Almighty God, as we gather together this morning, though not in person, but virtually perhaps, or in spirit, we pray for your blessing upon this time. As your word is opened up, we pray our minds and hearts are opened up to it. We pray that we are fed by it, that, that it quenches our thirst for knowledge of you. We pray, Lord, that as we come together, that we will behold what you have done for us. That as we look at this amazing creation that you have, and how little it takes to slow us down, may we be reminded of the things that you do release us from. That right now we are troubled by a physical threat, but that you offer release, that you offer freedom, that you have saved us from the eternal threat, that you have relieved us of our sin debt, that you have set us free. So Lord, as we gather together, we also look within ourselves and we realize that we have transgressed, that we have rebelled, that we have sought after our own desires instead of what pleases you, that we have done things where we put ourselves first, where we found it easier to love ourselves instead of love our neighbor. We found it more pleasing to be indifferent than to show compassion. Where we found it even better to do our will and not yours. We pray, Lord, that we know you as our Redeemer, as the one who washes away our sins. that we will be able to look upon one another the way that you would look at us. That when we see the need around us, we, we respond with hearts filled with compassion. That instead of being hurt ourselves, we see the hurt within others. That we do not we do not respond to anger with anger, but with love. Hear us now, O Lord, as we pray the words that Jesus taught his disciples to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Psalm number four. Answer me when I call to you, my righteous God. Give me relief from my distress. Have mercy on me and hear my prayer. How long will you people turn my glory into shame? How long will you love delusion and seek false gods? Know that the Lord has set apart his faithful servant for himself. The Lord hears when I call to him. Tremble and do not sin. When you are on your beds, search your hearts and be silent. Offer the sacrifices of the righteous and trust in the Lord. Many, Lord, are asking, who will bring us prosperity? Let the light of your face shine on us. Fill my heart with joy when their grain and new wine abound. In peace I will lie down and sleep, for you alone, Lord, make me dwell in safety. You are the word at the beginning, one with God the Lord most high. Your hidden glory in creation now revealed in you our Christ what a beautiful name it is what a beautiful name it is the name of Jesus Christ my King what a beautiful name it is nothing compares to this what a beautiful name it is. 
So Jesus, you brought heaven down. My sin was great, your love was greater. What could separate us now? What a wonderful name it is. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a wonderful name it is. And nothing compares to this. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus. First scripture reading this morning is from Acts 3, verses 11 to 19. Peter speaks to the onlookers. While the man held on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished and came running to them in the place called Solomon's Colonnade. When Peter saw this, he said to them, fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we had made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob the God of our fathers has glorified his servant, Jesus. You handed him over to be killed and you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. You disowned the holy and the righteous one and asked that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this by faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom we see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him, as you all can see. Now, fellow Israelites, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders. But this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that his Messiah would suffer. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. And the second reading today is from 1 John 3, verses 1 to 7. 
see what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, we are now children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we will see him as he is. All who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. But you know that he appears so that he might take away our sins, and in him is no sin. No one who believes in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or know him. Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. The one who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. And the final reading this morning is from Luke 24, four, verses 36 to 48. Jesus appears to the disciples. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, why are you troubled? Why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe it, because of joy and amazement, he asked them, Do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. He said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of all these things. The word of God for the people of God. I think one could write a small book with the title, things that are actually not in the Bible and, and fill many, many pages. Now, whether such a book would sell, that would be another discussion altogether, but I would say probably not as well as we think it would. And there are phrases that we might even think would be in the Bible. They might even have biblical connotations. They might even be the right things to say, but we actually don't find them in the Bible. For the longest time, I thought the phrase, robbing Peter to pay Paul, must have been in the Bible somewhere. I mean, when you look into it, there's not even a reference to it of what that would mean. Uh, when I did research it, I think it had to do with two uh, types of buildings, two, two abbeys that they built, and they were close enough to each other, and, and one was named after Peter, and one was named after Paul. I'm not sure. Uh, there's the other one that's not in the Bible, God helps those who help themselves. Not only is that not in the Bible, that one is dangerously opposite to the gospel message. Where in truth, God helps you because there is no way you could ever help yourself. And there could be a special chapter in this book, uh, one where we can talk about phrases or snippets from the Bible where, where we have words that have been isolated and cut from their context and twisted and tortured that people are happy to repeat, that could actually probably be the bigger part of the book. But whether or not these things are, are worth correcting really depends on the situation. But one that does cause me to wince ever so slightly is when I hear someone say, we are all God's children. Sometimes it might be the better call to let it slide. And other times it might be the occasion to speak up, to bring up to the point that not everyone is a child of God. Now it's true. We are all image bearers of God. Humankind was given attributes that only could come from our creator that set us apart from all the rest of creation. Tributes like compassion and love and hate and rational thought, mercy, forgiveness, but all of which are, are fallen, 
marred shadows of how they're actually meant to be played out that come nowhere near the perfect standard of that of God. We always mention that God is love, and that's true. And we love, but nothing close to how God loves. But we also hate things. And we hate things sometimes for the right reasons. We hate things sometimes for the wrong reasons. We hate things that we are not supposed to hate. And it would bemuse us to think that God does indeed hate and does so perfectly and righteously. God hates sin. God hates evil, and he does so perfectly. But that phrase, we are all God's children. The theological term that that gets the heading to this is referred to as the doctrine of adoption. What it means when one is saved by Christ, becoming part of the family of God, knowing God as father, Christ as brother. But we live in a world of broken homes, unfit parents, parents that might have been cold or distant to you, or perhaps even abusive. There's times where adoption leads to harm and abuse and heartbreak. And then when we try to speak of being adopted into God's family, it doesn't seem to be helpful or comforting, but it really should be. There's an overused cliche that you might often hear people say that Christianity isn't a religion, it's a relationship. Well, Christianity is a religion, and it is a relationship. And this is how we know. God, the Father, sent his Son, his one and only Son, because why? For God so loved. And the Father expresses that love and and he adopts you into his family to call you his son or his daughter. To raise you in his ways unlike any parent could. In fact, if you can look at all the poor examples of parenting, then that should let you know what the standard really ought to be. It's going to be more perfect and more loving than what we have ever experienced. And that is what John conveys to us in this letter that in in many many Bibles just requires one or two page turns to read all of 1 John. You can maybe read it in just over 20 minutes. And we just read a small portion in in 1 John chapter 3. Describes what being in your new family means. And also a dire warning of what it looks like of being mistakenly in that family, of not actually being part of that family, what it means to look inside and to inspect yourself. And this is the warning that follows. You see, handling the word of God is a heavy task. There are are no cookie cutter ways of handling everything, not all phrases and parts of the Bible we treat exactly the same way. Sometimes there are phrases that stand alone and they do the job on their own and they're beautiful. John 3, 16, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, Romans 5, 8. You could read those verses. Those are the ones that go on plaques. Those are the ones we hang on our walls. But you can't do that with all verses. You can't make that the norm. There's some verses that you will read, in particular, 1 John chapter 3. That would be startling if they were just left on their own. In particular, verse 6. 1 John 3, verse 6. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. And yet, as much as that can make sense, that's not even the word-for-word translation. I read that from the NIV, the New International Version. The NIV writers 
with the intention of this translation are not claiming a word-for-word -word translation. It's referred to as a dynamic translation. A dynamic translation means it's, it's worded best to make sense to the people hearing it, to convey the message, not aiming for a word-for-word. -word. If you do want word-for-word, -word, there's other translations, in particular the NASB or the King James Bible. Those have word-for-word -word translations where they each translate verse six this way. 1 John 3, verse 6 in the NASB. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has seen him or known him. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. See, the NIV adds words that do not appear in the original Greek language. For, to add the emphasis, and you wonder why they must have done that, where they add that keeps on part. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. Where can we get that reference? How, how can we reconcile that if we were to look at the translation where it says, no one who abides in him sins? Even if you adjust for the wording, keep on sinning. How is that helpful? How is that pointing us in the right direction? This is the trouble you can get into if you just isolate a verse. If you just pull it out of its context, expecting it to speak like a John 3.16 or a Romans 5.8. No one's going to hang 1 John 3.6 up on a wall. Even though it is truth. But we look at the wording all throughout. All throughout 1 John. What does it say when it's mentioning sin? When sinning is mentioned at the very beginning of 1 John, it's calling out the lie that sinners can sin without remorse, without any sense of shame or repentance. Because that is not what children of God do. John is not declaring that a Christian does not sin. That is not the case. This is how the letter begins in the first chapter by verse 8 at the beginning of 1 John. It says, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Christians, are not only called to believe. Sometimes I'm guilty of that with my messages where I just stress the believing part, but I'm, I, I really need to make sure I'm doing everything I'm called to do. Whereas Jesus began his ministry when he says the time has come, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe. As a child of God, you are called to repent, have a heart of repentance and believe. Not just believe in Jesus and that he will fix everything, but now it's also your duty as a child of God to live a life of repentance. As a child of God, you may end up battling desires for a long time. Desires that you don't even like anymore. Desires that you would want to keep far away from you as possible. The battle against the flesh, that if we let go unchecked, is a marker that one is not a child of God and instead a child of wrath, as it says in Ephesians 2, verse 3. But you are a child of God. You can look to the Ten Commandments. What does it say? Honor thy father and mother. And that takes on a new meaning now. As an adopted child of God, the king has brought you into his kingdom. And if that is true, do you now act like it? Or deep down do you still rebel? Do you instead attempt to level with yourself that you can get away with not giving God your all, but just most of yourself? that you can fool all the people around you and that will be enough to get by. Is it possible? 
that you hold on to a pet sin or talk yourself into believing that God forgives and that God will extend his grace for a perpetual sin that we do not relinquish. John says that is entirely wrong. Where you will sin, but a sin that you allow to continue one that you are willing to to hide and keep away from everyone else, that's where the trouble starts. And it comes in all forms. A wandering eye, the battle of lust, drunkenness, drug abuse, gossip, lying, theft, the, the list goes on. But here's the warning. Does it define you? Is that that part of your characteristic? Is that something that you carry with you? Is that that part of you now? Are you willing to let it happen in hopes that that God's mercy is greater than your perpetual lack of self-control? Are you letting it go unchecked? And is that any way for a child of God to behave? Do you not know just what your father is capable of? I remember in my teaching days, the vice principal of the high school had a tough job. He had to deal with all the discipline issues. Everyone who was sent to the office ended up having to go deal with the vice principal, not the principal, but the vice principal to be given, uh, whether it's the call home, the suspension, the detentions. But each time the vice principal would start with the same talk. And that talk would begin this way. He would say, we don't do that here. Maybe you can do that other places. Maybe you do that at home. Maybe you do that with your friends, but we do not do that here. And that's the message we have. That the battle may rage on, but allowing sinful behavior to carry on, we don't do that here. When we come together as a family, as the children of God, when we come together in worship, when we come together in fellowship, when we come together as as God's people, we are people who know that we are sick and we have come for the cure. We don't hide the symptoms or pretend that we feel fine when we're not. That shouldn't be the case. We should be people who want to be healthy, people who are willing to share our full medical history so it can be diagnosed and taken care of. And when we want health, by health, we mean a full and complete relationship the one who died so that we may live and be known as children of God. Amen. And to God be the glory. Let us pray. Almighty God, as we listen to the news, as we see the restrictions put in place, Here of the lockdown, we pray, Lord, for for all people all across our communities, our province, across this country, as far and wide as possible to pull together, to have solidarity, to have compassion, to have love, to have the wherewithal, to do what it takes to slow the spread of this virus, to lessen the burden on the medical systems, on the hospitals, in the ICU beds. We pray, Lord, for the infection rate to go down. We pray for each person infected to have healing. We pray for the impossible, miraculous healing that only comes from you. We pray for doctors and nurses and medical professionals to be astonished as health returns without explanation. 
we pray your blessing upon them, that your peace goes with them, that they will be refreshed, that you will give them wisdom, that you will give them a calm, a peace that goes beyond understanding. We pray that as each person ponders what it means to have a mortal life, that they'll be drawn closer to you in questioning what life is about. We pray, Lord, for those who will be isolated and cut off from friends and family. May the phone calls, may the letters, may the distancing continue in ways that that allow our spirits to be kept up. We pray for those whose jobs are affected at this time, means of income, ability to pay bills and support families is now being stressed. We pray for those who are afflicted by this. May they have their needs met. May they have your abundance poured upon them, Lord. For those who are going into a dark time emotionally and mentally, over worried and burdened, we pray for your peace, Lord. We also hold up to you beyond the pandemic things that still need prayer, relationships that need mending, families that are, that are struggling, broken hearts and broken relationships, health issues outside of the COVID pandemic, for those who are awaiting types of surgeries and procedures that are now put on the back burner. Pray, Lord, that that needs are met, that we continue to come to you in prayer, that you take each one of us, Lord, that, that you put in front of us ways that we are being your people, the hands and feet of Christ that you send us out to answer prayer. To show your love. We pray, Lord, in these uncertain times that, that we have no control over what these microscopic things do to us, but we do know that you are in control. That we don't see immediate reasons why things happen, but we lean fully on you in these uncertain times, knowing that you are our rock, the reason why we will not be shaken. May we continue to share this message of hope with those around us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
And now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.